Welcome back, everyone. My name is Dave from The Scout for another interview. And today we have somebody that I don't know. And that's the, the, the beauty of it, because I wanted to have a discussion with another Substack writer. His name is Justin Alston, and I don't know him. I want you to know him too. So we'll have kind of a discussion of who he is, who I am, and why Substack is great. And we'll just talk baseball. Justin, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure, man. And that's actually the, the great thing about this. We'll just get to know each other. You seem like a good guy. So who is Justin Alston? Uh, where are you from, man? Well, I live in upstate New York. Lived here my whole life. Uh, grew up major baseball fan, um, as you did. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, we're, we're both hardcore fans, as uh, we've talked a little bit before this interview. But um, no, I... Uh, Huge sports fan. I started uh, my baseball fan perspective blog on Substack here uh, back in March, and I've uh, been reaching out to readers and writers such as yourself, and been going from there. So, were you uh, a Yankees fan or a Mets fan? Oh, <laughs> no, 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 Atlanta Braves. Oh no! Oh yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm not a front runner Braves fan. That's actually I got hooked on baseball in the early '90s. Uh, oh, yes. mostly mostly due to tbs yeah, so nice. you know. and um my first baseball memory probably is that funny enough kirby puckett's catch in game six against the braves in the world series that one where he leaps up against the plexiglass yeah. there and uh then yeah the joe carter homer year after i mean the early 90s was when i started getting hooked and then once tbs we were always watching the braves and uh funny thing is though my family they're all red sox fans so nobody here. We live in New York. None of us are New York Mets or Yankees fans. Thank oh, God, right? <laughs> but but for, for those who don't know, I mean, uh, we you are forty one that you told me. I'm forty two, so we have the, we are the the same generation. For people who don't know, TBS was one of the first station to have the game of the week. So right. all over the nation, TBS was was broadcasting his own product. So the Atlanta the Brave. So they were pretty much uh, growing the brand, growing the, their station. So people all over the nation were Braves fan, even though yeah. they were not even in the same geographical situation. Right. And uh, a lot of the people I know now, friends, um, that's what they remember starting baseball with in this area, especially. I mean, I'm in a small town in upstate New York, so we didn't really have cable opportunities until 94, 95-ish, about then. Something called, I remember the first thing I ever had was Prime Star. <laughs> it was just a small, and then it went on from there. But but TBS had 100, back then, TBS carried, I think, 155 of their games a year. It's close to that. Mm -hmm. So you either were a Braves, if you weren't a Braves fan, you were either local, but you were very unlikely around here a fan of any of the teams in the Central or West regions because they just didn't have the uh, networks to watch mm -hmm. uh, nationwide. So, Yeah. I remember uh, me and my best friend at the time, uh, Sebastian, having uh, a discussion when we were uh, playing RBI baseball. We were playing <laughs> RBI okay. maybe 10 times a day, man. It, it was insane. <laughs> and during that time, we, I, I remember specifically, just imagine if we could uh, watch any game right now, yep. any game in the in the world, Dave. That will never happen. Come on, you're on, you're smoking. Yes, I'm smoking, man. And we just smoke weed. But you know, it just the fact that 20 years later, after TBS was kind of a this great uh, precursor in in the field of, of broadcasting all over the nation. Now, from my laptop, I can have pretty much every game I want, anytime I want, and games from the past in the archives. This is insane. I mean, just on your end, you have to be uh, consuming a lot of baseball, right? I do. I have, uh, like this year, I mean, the MLB TV package is mm -hmm. I mean, look, there there are some issues for sure. I, I do, like, so here I am. I live in New York, okay? I can't watch the Yankees here because Yes Network is, you either have direct TV, which I used to have, but without direct TV, you, you can't watch Yes in this region now. If I were living in the city, yes. But like, this is the thing. So like, I'm like right on the Vermont, Massachusetts border. So if I go over to Massachusetts right now and I turned on my MLB TV, I wouldn't get the Red Sox, but I could pick up Yankees and Mets games. It's I, the whole thing with the 
local broadcast networks are like RSNs and all. It, it, I hope one day base MLB does something where you can just buy a package and you get every game that you know you should be getting because more and more as yeah, I don't know if you know, but like today there's a game on right now. Uh, the Mariners are playing the Astros. It's on Peacock. Mm-hmm. Now you have to buy that app just to watch. Pe- I can't even though it's on MLB TV. Technically, it's on their list. It's blacked out. Oh. So I couldn't watch that game unless I had Peacock. Well, in Canada, I can watch that one. But oh. I, I, I got to defend. Um, okay, I got to defend MLB and, and the and the broadcasters just a little in that case because if I'm about to pay, I don't know, man, two point four billion dollars for the rights to your game, and you're telling me that for a small fee, a baseball fan can watch them and not watch mine, and then I got to tell the advertisers that. The, that those sets of eyeballs won't be watching me. I mean, I gotta say, dude, you gotta block them. You gotta block. Yeah, them. no, that that's a good point. You're, but then, you're but, good but point. then again, MLB should have a a way of of seeing these things. And okay, perfect. I have that many people uh, with MLB TV in that area and or that region. So I'm going to pay you the amount that you should have right now. You know what I mean? I I, I can't believe that there's not a calculation or an equation there where people could be just happy well here's an example youtube tv i have youtube tv now i was able to get sny and watch the mets all the way up until about i think it was like six weeks ago and Mm -hmm. suddenly youtube tv and sny didn't reach a new contract so now mets are off sny or off uh, youtube but there's an example like and i i just i don't that's the stuff that just drives the bonkers because now there's two less teams if i wanted to why if i were a yankees mets fan i'd be going nuts right now even though they stink <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be like hey i can't watch my team this sucks but if i as a braves fan for instance like they were playing they played the mets coming up they played the mets last week i, I the only time i can watch mets braves is if it right now if it's on like fox like mm-hmm. a national game or espn that's not on sny so i you know but hey that's the way of the world. <laughs> so. I know, I know, I know. So, so you have YouTube TV. Uh, are you able to watch other baseball games on YouTube? Okay, yeah. So, so the, the so the, the main the main channels, right? Right. So, if you have like a like I have Amazon Fire Stick. So the Fire Sticks where I have I have like my ML, I have it on my laptop, like MLB TV. So there is a separate thing. So I watch most of the games on MLB TV, but on YouTube TV, that's where your main networks are, like ESPN, Fox. Uh, FS1 and they show games throughout the week so sometimes on MLB TV they'll say it's blacked out because I'm supposed to be getting it on say a ESPN only game and then mm-hmm. I just flip the YouTube TV and watch it on there um it, it, it gets a little bit like yeah like yeah like I like I just wish everything was in one spot but mm-hmm. yeah there's so many games there's so many games and at least in the playoffs you get every game you're not going to miss games there but and I'd be prepared to pay just a little more, man. I, I haven't had cable for a long, long while. I have IPTV, but that's for another time. Getting back to a baseball fan perspective, if I remember our first exchange by email correctly, you uh, you began baseball fans per, per, baseball fan perspective. Baseball fan perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I, I speak way too fast. Um, <laughs> you began that uh, during the WBC, right? I did. That was, um, I knew I was going to be doing this uh, in April. I decided in February I would, but I wanted to warm up with the WBC and just see how I did sort of covering each day. And I enjoyed that. That was, that was more fun than I thought it'd be. Um, and I loved the intensity of that tournament. I didn't think it was going to be like that. I really didn't. Cause in past years it's been on, I didn't take it too seriously. And I, and then even this year when I saw the U S and that pitching staff they had, we're like basically 10 of the best pitchers in the U S didn't even sign up for it. like I've Merle Kelly of the diamondbacks was arguably their, their top pitcher. And he's a good pitcher, but I was thinking to myself, you know, if, the, if these countries aren't going to send out their best of the best and really take this seriously, then how as fans do we take it seriously? But what I respected was, Regardless, you know, most nations did put out their best players they could, and it was fun to watch. They played hard. They knew the stakes, and that last game between uh, U.S. and Japan there was a, was great. Mm-hmm. You know, watching Trout and uh, Otani go at it at the last of bat there. That was that was great. 
that was great. And so, no, I would definitely uh, in four years, I think it's four years again, I'll, I'll cover it again if I'm still doing this vlog and go from there. So, but, but it's a grind, man. And, and and something I've been working on maybe for the four or five, last four or five years is, um, first of all, working on myself and, and getting better each day at everything that I do. And the grind of a baseball player is is for me an inspiration and for you to do that every day the scout yeah i work a lot there's there's a lot of things that you don't see that are behind the scenes but on your hand i mean you have to show up every day how do you manage that um so once when the season started in april i just that's momentum like I get stoked for like that opening day. You're just like excited to get the season going. So it's just like, I would wake up in the morning if I had time. So I started doing it in the mornings. It just worked out better for my schedule to do that. But of late it's become, you know, like you said, it's a grind. So there are weekends I do want to take it off. But if I do that, I give the readers on Monday, usually a longer edition that sort of recaps Friday through Sunday with all the big stories. I try to break everything down in this series. But then there's weekends like this one where today I wrote wrote a pretty lengthy one on Saturday's games. I try to keep a schedule. The the most difficult part though is for sure the time of day getting it out. Like there'll be times like today I get it out at around 12 30. And then other days where if there's not any games till it's like tomorrow there won't be any games till around 6 40, 7 o'clock. I might wait, depending on my schedule for other things, to do it later in the day. My goal is always to get it done before the night games begin because trying to beat the day games can be tricky because sometimes mm -hmm. these games start 12, 12, 30. And, you know, it takes takes a little time to get all your statistics and notes from each game and then write and rewrite and just sort of proofread it, go over it. You know, I always want to send it. I don't want to rush it. You always want to make things look as best you can. And, um that I, I think the big that's the biggest grind is the first thing I do is recap each game. I just uh, I go through and I, I write my recaps, get my stats, and then when I put I then put that on to Substack. So I do it through Google Docs, and then I put all the notes on there. I just copy paste them over. But that's only half the battle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the rest is then doing like once I'm on there, then I find like a the clips of the day, um, find a couple pictures to put in there, and then. My, I think the part I enjoy the most is doing my offensive and defensive, offensive and pitching lines of the day, because that's what makes me think about what I just wrote. Like, all right, so who who was the best pitcher today? And I try to break it down as fairly and unbiased as I can. And uh, even though, like today, Eddie Rosario of the Braves was my hitter of the day, but he had a huge home run last night, so I went with him. He was four for four. Um, but then you have a guy like Julio Rodriguez who is unbelievable right now 17 right. hits in four games and he had four hits yesterday but it was only four singles so i can't put him ahead of somebody so but i enjoy doing it. that's the fun part that's the most fun i have in the whole thing is doing those the extra stuff or doing my uh sometimes i'll do a fan's perspective just if there's something going on that i want to just talk about and then at the end as you know i do the um just what's coming up today what to keep an eye on and so all in all, I think most of the reads are around five to eight minutes. But like on Mondays, if I'm doing a full weekend recap, I know last week, I think on Substack, it said it was around 13 or 14 minutes. But, you know, people can do what they want with it, but it's there. And um, but you're right. It is a grind. There's certain days and I'm sure you feel like this with everything, too. Like there's certain days you, you're you ready to get up. And you just feel like you're I'm ready to do this and you get it done like that. And then there's days where you have something else going on that you need to do first. By the time that's done, you're like, oh, I still got to do, still got to do the, the blog. So I think I've missed four or five days of the blog since opening day, but I've tried to make up for it by doing longer editions later on. Um, so overall, right now it's about just building the readership and getting people spreading the word. And, you know, I wouldn't do this if I didn't love the game. There's no way. But even if I were just a moderate fan, I don't think I would have even attempted to try this. But I've always enjoyed writing like you. Um, yeah, I had a fantasy baseball, like I still do, for 20 years. And for 20 years, I've been writing weekly articles and that within our league about our teams just for fun. And I think that's what really got me into writing, um, especially about sports. So 
I just thought of a fantasy baseball league for Substack writers, man. That would be <laughs> awesome. Dude, I have to take a note, man. Jesus. <laughs> Let me know. <laughs> fantasy baseball. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Oh, my. That would be awesome. Now, do you do, you do fantasy at all? With, yes, uh, I do. Uh, with, yeah. uh, I, I have two leagues right now. Both are on uh, Yahoo. Uh, okay. I love it. I, do, I don't get obsessive about it. Uh, about most things I do. Uh, if I win, I win. If I don't, I just want to have fun, man, because yeah. it, just, it, it keeps me in the game. Yeah, well, the league we runs on uh, fan tracks, and we've had a group of guys for nearly 20 years. So oh, there's man. a core, and we, you know, you customize all your, your rules and statistics. And so, yeah, we take it. We take, It's fun, but we take it pretty seriously. Um, but it, it, again, if you didn't love baseball, there's no way we'd still be doing it after nearly two decades. So. <laughs> And do people, um, okay, so, so you were talking about something that, that that's very interesting to me. So you, you do talk about the, obviously the, the scores and, and a summary of pretty much each game and, um, and the, the best tracks, the best, the best tracks, the best line of the day. Yeah. And do people sometimes say, Hey man, I'd like to get that before 12. Not yet. Not I, yet. Would, okay. I would think though, if I, if, if my readership, if I can, over the next year or so, build it up to respectable, like a more respectable number. I mean, I've tried. I there's, I get, I get a few new readers a week, um, just without even having to reach out to people. Just Substack readers, you see that, and you you probably see it too on your when you get a new reader. But there's more work I personally need to do to to build it up. And I've been when you're when you're not writing, you also got to remember there's another part to this to get more readers. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've had luck with some people I know sharing it and passing the word on to other people and they become members. I mean, I don't know right now how else to do it. And um, other than doing more things like we're doing right now and just getting word out there, um, that's that's where we are. And uh, But there will be a time, I'm sure if this builds up to something bigger where I will have a deadline for it, like each day. Cause I, want, I do want people who are reading it to think, oh, it's 11 a.m. should be coming in my inbox which is another thing I really like about Substack is the inbox. So mo I, I assume most of the readers, I don't know, the people I know that are on it probably read it through their email. They don't have to go on to the Substack app or the web page to, mm. to read it, even though I tell them there's a nice app. I like the app. The web page is very nice too, but if they want to read it in their emails, feel free. But I know that at some point it will have to be within a certain hour that I try to get it out each day. This year, though, like I've told you, just with life in general, just as long as I get it out each day before like those night games, I'm pretty happy with that. But ideally, you want to get it out before the start of every game. No doubt. Um, so this is where it gets weird, man, because there comes expectation. So in the beginning, you want to impress people. Let's be quite honest with here. I mean, yeah. you want to impress people. So, OK, I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll do that. But then people get Hooked. So, oh yeah, you offered that for free? Tweet, man. Jesus Christ, man, for free in my inbox? Well, I'll take it. And then, oh, okay, but there is going to be a paywall. Do you know? Oh, I won't pay for that. So, okay, so what are we doing there? Because you have to do something that people will get hooked on. And yeah. then you have to just manage what people will pay for. And if you, and even if you don't have a paywall, which I don't even think I'll put in, in, in the, in the medium to the, in the short to medium term, uh, you have to uh, just keep on giving the exact same thing and even bigger thing just to, to get people attracted to even more of, of your perspectives. Sure. Um, and a lot of it is, like I said, if I didn't love this, I would not even, <laughs> I would, if I didn't love it, because I do love doing this every day. If I didn't love it though, I'd probably only do one or two a week. Mm. Just, I don't even know what I'd write about. Just sort of, that's what happened over the last four days. That's what happened over the weekend. I'm, I'm just brainstorming here because the, the, one of the things, unless I didn't see it on Substack, uh, there is no place on Substack like the like a home base where I could see every damn article that is published on Substack, uh, as much on religion, on uh, on 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 es esotericism, on on baseball, on on volleyball. I would like like a feed, even if the feed goes very fast, because if there are I don't know 
50,000 writers, it would, be, it would go very fast. But I would like that kind of, of place where I could go and then go to a place like a sub sub stack and go <laughs> to baseball. And then every post, yeah. even if the post is bad, I want to see it. You know what I mean? So that, yeah. that, that would be awesome too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I do like uh, when I open up my sub stack, for instance, I have your site on there and everything. Every time there's somebody who posted something new, at least they keep your reads organized. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, that's great. And most of mine on Substack are sports related. Um, Cause like you, I'm looking for more other baseball writers and to see what they do. Um, but I know, I think you make a, you make a good point. Um, and I, you could email, there's, there's ways to contact Substack. They're always open to new ideas. The one thing I've noticed, even in the few months I've been on is they're constantly upgrading and making changes for the better for everybody. Um, just ways like the notes. There's that new, uh, the notes yeah. now. You, you can post notes. And um, I certainly am like you with Substack, though, as far as the interface and just the simplicity of what they offer. I mean, there's a couple of things you're kind of like, oh, I wish they had, like, I wish I could underline <laughs> certain mm -hmm. things. But for the most part, they have, it's, I can get on there, do my writing, and it looks good. I'm fine. Off we go. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, I've, I've read about other sites that do similar things. And th this has always been the one that I was reading the most about that most people positive, positive stuff with it as far as just the writing itself. And uh, no, I've, I've learned a lot using it for sure. But they seem to have this kind of mentality of less is more, which fits quite nicely with what I'm with my life right now and the way I'm developing. I mean, I'm not the, the same guy I am at 42 that I was at 25. Thank fucking God. But it, it's, it, it's I, I love the less is more. And the I think they let the the content speak for itself. So, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Look at this interface, man. His website is sick. I mean, the content is, is <laughs> shit, but Jesus Christ, it looks so good. But on Substack, there's like, you just can't hide. So, it, I mean, it's simple. It's um, uh, in French is if yes, it's um, it, it, it does the work yeah. that it should do. But if your content is good, you will rise up. So the, the cream rises to the top. And yeah. that's one thing I like, don't you think? Yes. And then the other thing is you, I would never put on the paid mode yet for just what I'm doing until I know I have a good fan base, just people who are enjoying it. How much? I mean, that, that's going to take Do you have time. a number in, a, in, in your head? Well, only numbers that I've read online. Um, like a lot of people, you know, there, there's that old saying to get your, build your tribe, right? You got to get your tribe of 10,000 readers. And um, I've read, there's a couple sub stacks out there. That's the goal. You get a thousand, 10,000. You keep what some of the writers do is we know they give like the free Fridays to keep their non-subscriber or their non-paid subscribers going. But if you can get 10,000 or even 5,000, and if you can get, a third of them or half of them to become paid subscribers. Ideally, that's what you're looking for to make, you know, decent money on the site. I think that's, that's what everyone's, I, I say that's what everyone's goal is, but when I'm listening to you, it, it sounds more like you're, you're like me right now. It's just right now we're just doing it because we love it. Mm -hmm. um, and if down the road, you're not going to turn down the money making opportunity if it's there, but uh, it takes time. It certainly takes time um, to build. And I think that would be my off season goal. No, in the off season, I'm going to, I think that's where I'll spend more time trying to get word out there about the, the blog because I'll have more time. I won't be focused so much on the writing. I can get more people to come in and see, and I'll still write in the off season, but. That's um, interesting. Uh, oh, wow. That's an interesting take because if you can, okay. Okay. I'm not saying you won't offer any content. Obviously, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you can offer the content, Oh, okay, so you'll just change uh, what you're writing about, right? In the in the off season. Oh yeah, no, in the off oh, season, okay. yeah, for sure. There won't. I mean, look, there there might be some like the winter leagues could be fun to follow and do some writing on that, which I could. Um, oh my god, I, I could. I mean, I don't know. This this is you will. you will you will you <laughs> will. Well, you told me that about the WBC. Like I I got involved with that and I enjoyed it. Um, but I could see myself once the playoffs are over, come November, December, just wanting a little time to 
back off baseball because it's basically been seven month grind. Um, and I'm usually like that every year before I started this blog, every year baseball ends that November, December period, you're kind of like, all right, a little, a little break here. But as soon as the winter meetings start up and trades start going down, you start thinking, when's uh, when are they reporting the spring training? Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I, for me, that's cause I, that's my favorite. It's by far my favorite sport is baseball. And I'm thinking about baseball once, once spring hits, it's like, that's my thing. I can't wait. Can't wait for spring training and just following all the happenings. Um, hopefully we don't have too many more spring trainings. Like, you know, we have with these uh, problems with delays to the season and such, but that's, that's every what, five years, it seems <laughs> four years but with the CBA. Um, yeah, no, it, 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 I think right now, I, all I can do is take it one day at a time and then go from there. And I, I, I'm I'm surprised, unless I'm mistaken, I'm surprised that the kind of the model of uh, baseball writers coming uh, under one roof has not been exploited yet on, on Substack. What I mean by that, and by the way, I'm just thinking outside the box here. I'm just thinking out loud. Um, you come to uh, to the scout. We, you, we see how many views you have for each post. And let's say there's $100 coming in. You have 50% of the readership. I have 50% of the other, or you know what I mean? So, I mean, I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet because there could be like a daily thing with you. I could have this thing and then this guy, or you know what I mean? So, it, I yeah. because from I mean, this you could, you could have a lot of writers under your umbrella in a way. Yeah, no, that would be a really cool idea. And this is where I think we're, you and I are trying to figure out Substack as far, we'll know more. This, if we have this interview again, this like in a year, the same day, we'll know far more about just how well we're doing getting our readership. And then ideas like that, I could see taking off. I I don't know. I, I could see also building, just having a website of our own and having readers from Substack or writers from Substack, baseball writers all on that one website that we can direct them from our Substack accounts to that as well. I mean, there, there's, there's possibilities with that. Um, but yeah, you're right though. So you think Substack would have something like that, right? I, I understand what you're saying. But, but, but then again, I mean, it's not their job to do that. I mean, yeah. it, it's ours to do because it, as, as soon as I have your, your access to baseball fan perspective, I incorporate uh, the, the the scout. I, I'm just I'm just uh, reversing the roles right now, so I incorporate my m material to yours, and then I, as long as there's a trust there for the money coming in and coming out, I mean we don't have any expenses. People have to realize that uh, when you don't make any money on Substack, you don't have to. Uh, it, it's completely free. Everybody right. can have a Substack right now and just share their passion. Everybody. Everybody mm -hmm. in the world right now. So that's what I like about that. But I, I, I'm surprised because if I'm a fan and I have your perspective, I have my content, I have Sean Murphy's content, I have Calcaterra, which is kind of what we do right now. Or uh, there's this guy uh, who plays on Diamond Mine. He plays on Diamond Mine and he simulates games on YouTube. And then he puts that on Substack. The guy is passionate. He's a former um, writer with the hardball Hardball times, if I'm not mistaken. So okay. all this, all this content. If I'm a baseball fan, and I have another, I don't know. There's this guy who loves um, the baseball cards. He's a baseball card collector. If I have all these aspects on one side, and you say to me, for seven bucks um, a month, you can have all this content. You have this one free, this one free, and then the rest you have to pay for. Seven bucks a month. And then I, I don't have to go to that side, that side, that side. That's organized. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's what I, I've been saying I like about your, just your own individual blog setup. I like how you have, what is it, uh, six or seven different categories at the top Pretty there fine. to Pretty keep fine. everything. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, it's great. I enjoy going through all those and just seeing how you do that because that's that would be, I think, if you were going to do it, you're saying one web, one page to cover five or six writers doing their same same thing, like writing about baseball. You could categorize it either by name or Justin Alston or Dave Raleigh. Like you just go up and then people can just click there. It's all in one place. You don't have to keep going from page to page. That's a great 
great idea if it's if it's doable for sure. Not only that is uh, you don't even you can't even um, you, you can exactly see which people read what. Anyway, I don't I don't know if it's interesting to uh, to people right now, but uh, we we got on the tangent. Um, so the winter leagues are you interested in international baseball too, or you're mainly MLB? I follow international baseball when I'm interested in certain prospects or something. There's always that name out there too mm -hmm. every year. Um, so I'll tune in to just check stats and stuff. But as far as no, I would say MLB is number one. Minor league baseball too. I enjoy following that, seeing the prospects. Again, I think having a fantasy league like we have, it's a dynasty league. So it makes me more aware of these, mm -hmm. these younger players as well. Um, the other thing is on MLB TV, just so you know, they have all minor league games now. Oh, I know. You watch oh, I know. Oh, you didn't? Yeah, so oh, I know. that's pretty cool. That's really cool. I mean, I haven't tuned into many, but it's neat to think that, hey, I can watch this kid tonight if I really want to. Um, but no, with the international, no, I, I think a lot of it's because how do you how do you watch it on TV in this country? I mean, I, I, do you watch it as well? Uh, what, how do you follow it? I'm a weirdo, man. I I just yeah. booked, I just booked a flight and reserved a car for for the Republic Czech. I mean, two hours ago, I'll be in uh, in the Republic Czech near Prague. Like, there's like six sites uh, for the European Ch Baseball Championship 2023. Oh, so it's awesome. from September 24 to October 1st. I got my ticket for the finals and the semifinals, and then I'll just um, I'm just takes some of, uh, of the other games and, and I'll just visit the place so I can use baseball to to travel because I have the time and, and I have the financial means to you but yeah I do like baseball because that's where I was going and I don't know if you want to go there because and I don't even know if that answers your question but yes <laughs> I do uh, I do love international baseball for this reason which is um it, I, I, I I've talked about this in pretty much all the interviews that, I, that I've done right now, because this is a process inside of me right now and, and, and for baseball too. People struggle every day at their craft. So it's baseball right now that we're talking about. And, they're, and, and they wanted to reach the aisle level. So they enjoy the game, they enjoy the game. And once you reach the aisle levels, there's expectation and you get paid pretty much for what you've done in the past. Yes. So, so what... So, so what I so what I really love right now is a guy like David Burns from Baseball Jobs Overseas, who's kind of a power broker in baseball, just putting the, those players who just want to travel, have fun, drink beer after a game, and play a high level of baseball in Australia, New Zealand, Africa, uh, Kenya, I mean, everywhere in the world. So this passion for the sport seems to be lost at the higher levels. And I think that's why I'm attracted to college baseball and international baseball. Does that make any sense to well, you? Well, I, I was trying to, I wish off the top of my head, I, mean, it was either, I think it was Tom Glad. Somebody said it in a game last night I was watching. They said, uh, if you were going to manage right now, not on the major league level, because obviously that's, you know, you'd want to do something like single A, because that's where the players are coming in that are playing their hearts out, trying to, they're hungry. I think the, I I actually think it, I could be wrong, but Jeff Francoeur, I'm pretty sure, said that during the broadcast of the Braves game last night. That it's because it's they're at the high, they're hungry. So if you're managing that, it's so much easier to manage players that are going all out than kind of hot dogging it. Like I remember, I was listening to your inter, your last interview and with him, and he was saying that like some of the players, it's a mix of players. You have players that are really good that are trying, and then you have the the kind of the slackers who are just there. They want their yeah yeah. They want their beer. They just want to hang out, but it's a league for everybody. And um, yeah, those smaller leagues, of course, why when you said you, uh, I read your article on going to the Wakona Park here in Pittsfield, which is literally a half hour from it. Mm. And uh, it's a great stadium. Yes. And it, it's just, it's such, there's so much history there, but it, I love the way that you took the picture and then you had the 3D model of it. And just uh, the way you, you wrote about that game was, was awesome. And you could tell the players, I mean, from what you were writing, it was a great game, and the players were, uh, they aren't just out there messing around. Baseball is life, man. I mean, yeah. the, 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 that game was, uh, dude, I, I don't, the, the Sea Unicorns. The Sea Unicorns were, were losing 
was that a sea unicorn? Anyway, they, they, they were they were beating them all the way through. And then at the end, something clicked, man. It, it's baseball. And I, I'm not saying it's lost at the higher levels. It's just the expectations and the, the vibe of the game is quite different. I love it. Yeah. But give, I mean, this experience in the Czech Republic, I know is going to, without me getting too metal dramatic, it's going to change me. I know. I, I know it. It's going to change the way I see, feel, and analyze the game. It's it it. it I, I know it. Well, it's probably going to be a different brand of baseball too. I think that'll be interesting to see. I I think the one thing, and you you I don't know if you agree, but the one thing that's changed in baseball the most is just sort of the lack of fundamentals, especially at the big league level. Like not you see it once in a while, but not seeing guys being able to with first and first and second no outs being able to bunt somebody off. You're like a 180 hitter, 200 hitter, and you have an opportunity to move those runners over, get them to second and third with one out. That used to be a big deal. Mm -hmm. it, but when guys try it now, more than half the time, it's an ugly thing. <laughs> it's pretty ugly to watch because they're either going to pop it up, strike out, trying to bunt, or, or it's just – and I think on the lower levels, I – Maybe I'm wrong because there's a reason now where there isn't as much going on in the big leagues as far as when everyone's trying to swing hard and swing the fences. But you wonder now if at that, like going overseas and seeing those games, if they play fundamental baseball. I mean, watching the WBC and I watch Japan and the way that they slide feet first and get right back up. You watch Otani, uh, Masataka, Yoshida. You watch how they slide. They are going head first and flying all over the place, potentially injuring them their shoulders or their neck for the rest of the year. I admire the way that some of these countries play baseball, even though they might not be um, considered the, the best of the best players. Who cares? It's still, who cares? It's the fundamentals of it. And they're not getting injured every single time they make a silly head first slide. And uh, no, I'm all about, I, I miss the fundamentals of baseball. I think if I were to pick one thing that I remember growing up, like I was saying in the nineties, it's that fundamental stuff. And it's, but it's in all sports. It's it is like I watch. I was a huge basketball fan. I still watch basketball. But oh, if you if you told me I could watch games from the nineties or early two thousands, eighties, any of that over what we have today, uh, there's that's what we're that I love that grind out basketball style that we used to watch. Nowadays, it's just there's no, no defense. Everyone's chucking up threes, even if you're seven foot. And for me, that's just like. How many all-star games a year do I need to watch? <laughs> and now an all-star game's literally 200 to 180 at the end of the game because nobody's even trying to play. So I'm hoping I, I, right now for me, sports as a whole, but especially baseball and basketball has become uh, something where there's a little bit missing that I, I wish would come back. And I think it's that competitive play hard nosed all the time and um, do the right things fundamentally too. But I don't know, going back to what we were saying, I don't know if on the lower levels they're they're trained like that anymore. I really don't. Because I I keep looking at all these arm injuries in baseball, and it's been going up and up and up every year. And it has to go back to how they're being trained when they're in high school and beforehand. Because, yeah, even in the 80s and 90s and stuff, people had Tommy John surgery, but not, not like it's going down now. I mean – Look what's happened to Tampa Bay. McClanahan's having a second Tommy John surgery. I love them, but I, yeah. I, I have no pity at all, man. No pity. You, you want to throw 101? Dude, perfect. But don't complain afterwards because not only is that a, a poor spectacle for the for the fans, but afterwards, oh, you, you're injured. Well, fuck yeah, you're injured, man. You, you're asking your body to do something that's so unnatural. And even 96 is unnatural. Put the goddamn ball in play, man. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I I um well it makes you it makes you miss players like uh well Braves fan, Greg Maddox, right? Who yeah. and Tom Glav and guys who, you know, they could get the strikeout, but they were they were throwing a contact and they they knew where to put the ball to get them to hit the ball where their infielders or outfielders were likely going to be, and that's what made them great. It's a lost start now. I mean, there are some. There, trust me. There, are, I I watch enough baseball. No, there are some mechanically sound pitchers out there even today. There's some great pitchers, which is why I think it bugs me so much when players are taken out of games after 90 pitches. They're like uh, Spencer. I wrote about it a couple of days ago. Spencer Strider 
for the Braves. He had a one hitter going, 97 pitches, 10 strikeouts against the Giants, scores only four nothing. And they just say he's pulled. Now the Braves won. But what if the what if the bullpen didn't have it going that day and the Braves lost that game? And it, it, to me, it's like, why not give Strider a chance to to keep going? You don't know if he can go 120 pitches till you let him try. Mm-hmm. And that's something that for some reason and, and, and managers and front offices minds today. And I don't know exactly the year it started. I feel like it was around the time of Mark Pryor and Kerry Wood when uh, Dusty Baker would have them yeah. throwing 130 pitches. That was around the time when they started getting worried about players throwing too much. Exactly. But it was never an issue before that. But look how fast they were throwing at then compared to now. I mean, there's five, six mile difference on the fastballs. And well, like you said, don't throw as hard. Mm-hmm. Throw, throw crisp. You don't need to throw your arm out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's, I don't know where, I, I honestly, you got to wonder like in five years, how many, where a starting pitcher is going to be then as far as any pitch, because if they can get 200 anymore, that's considered amazing. <laughs> but then we're lowering the bar for the all-time statistics because <laughs> people know from reading my blog, I, I admire Mike Trout just, you know, for his talent and all he's done. I'm not here to bash Mike Trout at all because Mike Trout is a great player, but I'm sorry to put him up there with the all-time greats. You got to be on the field for me. And he hasn't been. Mm-hmm. And if you look at his counting stats, I'm sorry, he's he's not an all-timer. Yeah, he's one of the best players up to the last 10 years, no doubt. And he's, his career started fantastic. But he's won three MVPs. When I could count, he should only have one. Um, that one he won back in 19 to beat Bregman on the uh, Astros when he didn't even play in September and the Angels were way out of the race. I'm sitting here like, well, why is he winning these awards? He didn't play. And they look at that one stat war which drives me nuts because i still i'll ask ask anybody ask a friend of yours sometime a baseball fan how do you calculate war if they can't tell me in under 10 seconds how it's calculated i don't want to know and that's the problem if you look at the formula for war you want to drive me nuts like how the who came up with this i think war is one of the strangest stats that has become the stat in baseball whenever you're talking about especially hitters but pitchers now too and i'm like can't we use our eyeballs and just see what these guys are doing? And like, I, I can look at Ohio a time. Bit of ground. Let's do it. But there's a yeah. bit of ground here because I, I really think war adds adds to the debate, adds to the discussion, and it. I really think it captures the value of a player. I really think so. But where I disagree, where I agree with you, is baseball reference as one set of rules where fan graphs will have one set of rules too so two ways of calculating it you're right exactly. yeah. so but that's where that's where you will lose me but like if i ask you right now i'm gonna put you on the spot can you tell me the formula for war i have no idea oh, <laughs> and that's why like all right, if you, that's just me though like but if you ask me like how do you calculate the stats we all grew up with and have been around baseball for the last century and a half mm-hmm. you know on base percentage the slugging percentage the stats that most voters for all the years up till around the last 10, 15 used as, hey, first off, you generally to win an MVP, other than unless you were like Alex Rodriguez with that ridiculous year at Texas where the team stunk, but he had the what, 56 hours. I'm trying to remember now, but he won an MVP because no one else in the American League statistically was even close to him. But nowadays, guys win MVPs. They can play 120, 130 games. And if they're war, is high enough, but their counting stats aren't. People are like, war is a theoretical stat to me. It, it, and that's what it is. So you're basically saying, in theory, this is what he's doing. And I think when Mike Trout won that MVP in 19, they were thinking, because the funny thing is, Alex Bregman's war that year was better because he played more games. So not only did he beat Trout at his, his own game by beating him in war, and he had better counting stats, he still lost the MVP to him. And I don't understand that. The Astros were... But it's I, think, just like- I mean, to, to be quite honest, with, I, I think you are right about this, but I think four or five years ago, war was still considered kind of um, exotic. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So, so I mean, the peace ball has changed a lot. I mean, from two years, there was this one broadcast over the, um, I have no idea when that was. I mean, there was the average, the RBIs and the war. And I said, 
10 years ago, you would have told me that this would be the way it would be shown on the screen. I would have said, you are crazy because somebody who's been in love with the game for, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 years, and who doesn't recognize itself in the way it's shown today, well, sir, I totally empathize with you. Totally. Mm -hmm. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So because mm -hmm. it, it, it's lost its a sense. I, I, I know we, we or I sound old right now, but that's why I, I'm the College World Series, man. Have you ever seen the College World Series? Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. The games are for free on YouTube. All the games uh, the, and, and even the commercials are just uh, scrapped. You can <laughs> watch the game. I mean, they, they record a 5-3 put out. It's like they won the, world, the real World Series. It, it, they, they cherish every moment. It's, I, I'm, I'm thinking about this. And no, you're, 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 yeah, they, I 100% agree. Yeah, that's and it's it. the same with like college basketball, March Madness. I guess why everyone loves March Madness, right? Because it's even though it's a, except it's, me, except it's me. The ugly... <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's games aren't pretty, but yeah. the players are going all out. There's no, there's no quit. And that, what are they playing for now? Well, <laughs> we won't get into that, but they are some of them are playing for some uh, benefits and bonuses now. But but it's yeah, you still you college World Series, same thing. Yeah, I mean those guys are just everything matters. And they know it. And uh, I think we get that in MLB playoffs. I do. Once the playoffs start, you, these guys, like last year's playoffs, I thought were great. There were mm -hmm. some epic games, especially early on. And uh, no, that's when players are going at their best. And uh, I understand that. But what bugs me is, like, how many games now players miss just for, like, random maintenance days on the assumption that by giving them a couple of days off here and there, which ends up being more than that, in the long run, because they end up getting hurt anyway. I'm just sitting there like, well, what, what's the point? What's the point? There, There is nothing to prove by resting players and taking them out early in games. There, there, I haven't seen one, one piece of evidence that says this is saving players' careers. Because if anything, players are getting paid more now to play less. I will, say I, something. I will say something. That, um, do you know the have – you, have you read the book of Joe, Joe Madden uh, and Tom Verducci? No, but I read that. I, I know they have that podcast, right? That you're... Make yourself a favor. Not only okay. do you should you should you read the, the 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 book. It's, dude. It's so down to hurt. It's simple, and it's exactly what we're talking about. The analytics have their place. Numbers don't lie. I don't care what you say to me. Numbers don't lie. But they, mm -hmm. don't, but they don't tell everything. You know what I mean? So, right. so there's a place for analytics, but there's also a place for placing those analytics and just interpreting them. Because right. if you apply everything that you think that they say, that's one thing. But what I wanted to uh, finish on is uh, the, the, the last episode of the Book of Joe, because there is a podcast that goes with that. I think that's the best um podcast out there along with effectively wild with um oh, jesus ben uh, ben uh, ben something and also a uh, talking baseball because uh, those three podcasts i think offer pretty much everything hardcore um okay so they, they offer hardcore statistics they offer kind of the of the frat man uh take and the book of joe there's the experience and kind of this zen like attitude to i've been there we should do that but again Bill, the Bill jackson way yeah, <laughs> but, I don't think Zen. I think Phil Jackson, right? The coach, the Lakers. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the last episode with uh, uh from the the book of Joe, the podcast is with Tom House, which is one of the he's the guy to listen to right now on on pitching mechanics and what uh and how to build arm strength and how to prevent injuries. Justin, listen, and everybody oh, well. for the 4.6 listeners right now, please <laughs> listen to this interview. You you really should. It's free. It's free for you. And everything, it, it's so, it's so, there's no nonsense. You know what I mean? So you should, I, I, I'll, I'll share check it, it out. Now. Yeah, send it to me. Uh, well, I, I know you've, you've mentioned it before in your writings. I will check it out for sure. Thank you. Before yeah. we go to your, uh, before we wrap things up and go to your uh, 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 end of season predictions, um, do you do you ever read books or I mean baseball books? Or do you have like yeah. one favorite books? One yeah, favorite? well, uh, 
<laughs> over the winter, I read Anthony Kastrovitz, you know, the right, he wrote a book on sabermetrics. Which one? That was a book. Boy, see this, I'd have to look at the name of it. He, it's a long title. He wrote it, I think, five years ago, four years ago. Anthony um, Castro? And Anthony Castrovitz, right. He's MLB.com writer. Um, but it's basically, the, the title isn't very, like, this is breaking down sabermetrics for the fans. In other words, he... What I liked about it was he he writes to you in a very story type way, telling you about his past and what he used to think about analytics and not comparing them to today and how important they are. And it goes into the wars, it goes into the FIP, fielding independent pitch and all that stuff, which like you say, is really good to know. And I learned a lot reading that book. And if you asked me every stat he threw at me, I could probably remember 50% of how they were calculated, but there were so many that I, I'm glad I have it for reference whenever I want to look at something. Exactly. But so much of it, like you say, it's front office. It's great for the front offices, but when they start flashing this stuff at a game on a screen, like most fans don't know what the hell they're, what the hell it is. And they don't explain like the, the baseball, fan, even if you're not like a major baseball fan, everyone knows what batting average, home run, RBI, slugging, well, slugging on base percentage, but those are like the main core stats that, I think when you're watching a game, the average fan understands when they see it on the TV or at a game when they show it. But when you start throwing in all these sabermetric stats for the average fan, I mean, you and I are more than average fans. I like some of the sabermetric stats, but some of them just drive me nuts because they're, they are so theoretical. Um, but I think for the average fan, if you want to make baseball popular again, that's you keep to the stats that people understand and they're simple to know. Like, but his book, no. So I think that's what you're asking. Like, do I read books on? That's one book I just have by my desk. If I ever want to pull it out, um, I have um, have a couple. Like, I'm reading. I'm down to the last eight players in Joe Pazanski's Baseball 100. I've been reading that for the last few months. Do you like it? I love it. And, the, and well, <laughs> I love how he writes. Okay. He's, he's a fantastic writer. He's a great storyteller. Right, before we uh, we wrap things up, as I said, uh, your end of season predictions, man. Who will win the 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 wild card spot? This is a okay. Well, this is funny because I have, I have my, yeah. Well, I have my list here of my oh, pre my preseason picks that I made on the site before the season start. I'll just go over them quickly. My twelve teams to get in. I had. Toronto winning the AL East. Hmm. Yeah, they could get in as a wild card, maybe. If, if sure. Seattle doesn't cool off here, they might not even get in. AL Central, I had Cleveland. Yeah, that's not happening, I don't think. Houston, the AL West, you know, they'll get in one way or the other, I think. And then uh, my wild cards were Yankees, not happening. White Sox, not happening. And the Mariners. Now the Mariners are fighting back. So I'm looking in the AL at probably th at best three out of six getting it out of my predictions nl and the nl east i had the braves nl central the cardinals <laughs> hey, wow, what what a disaster uh, that season was i didn't think i mean i don't know how you can be so bad in that division i mean i though we're looking at a few good teams they're, they're all cincinnati's way better than i thought they'd be but they have a lot of young talent i enjoy watching them play but the cards are out. all right. So cards are out. Now the NL West one is probably my, I, I'm most surprised by this one. I, the Padres not even being close. They just got swept by the Diamondbacks over the weekend in a series. They really had to have Padres mm -hmm. aren't in it. They're five and a half out right now. Um, my wild card Mets. <laughs> they're not. <laughs> oh my it. God. <laughs> I mean, I basically, all right, my other two wild cards, Dodgers, Brewers, where well, they're looking like they're going to win the division. So I'll get those teams in. But basically, looking at my 12 teams I had, I'll be lucky to get six of them in. And then and I did like uh, ALCS, NLCS predictions. Astros over the Jays in uh, six games. That could still happen, I guess. And then the Braves over the Cardinals in seven games. <laughs> <laughs> I really reason I, I remember writing about the uh, Braves Cardinals I said, oh, this is gonna be an epic series right now but the Braves have the, the talent will yeah not happening and then I have the Braves beating the Astros in seven in the World Series and I'll still stick with that World Series right now I don't see any reason why the Astros the Braves can't meet um I'll be shocked and I, I have a couple friends and around here that we're all Braves fans and we we've all said I'll be shocked if, if the Braves don't at least make the World Series with this team probably the best one two nine 
offensive team I've watched in my lifetime. And there's not a weak spot in that line. I love watching this team because you can't really get up and go get something to drink when even uh, like someone like Orlando RC is up the bat because mm-hmm. he's suddenly a pretty solid hitter in a lineup last year. He wasn't even going to start the year with a job. It's very good. Um, this year. It's unbelievable. And so like, I just think the Braves have enough pitching, definitely enough bats that, I don't think they'll – if they're playing at their best, there won't even be a series they play in that goes the distance. Mm-hmm. I think that. I think they're – look, if you're looking at a team that will only lose one or two games in the playoffs, assuming everyone's, as it is right now, healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll see. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you, mentioned, you mentioned the Mets, man. I think they're they're the po- poster child for what we were talking about um, earlier. You're a fan in New York. Your owner from comes from the fan, financial market is a billionaire. He doesn't care. No, not that he doesn't care. I'm putting thoughts. Oh, yeah, he cares. He, he, it. Cares. It, 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 no, he cares, but yeah. he bought a team. He dismantled it in the same six months. Unbelievable. In the same six months, you get attached. So, hey, man, I, I want to get that, that jersey with Verlander. Well, your jersey, I mean, it's not that it's not worth anything, but how can you form an attachment to a team when six months later, all that money that you spent doesn't mean anything? And he paid to get those guys out. Just yeah. think about I, I By the way, the, the trades that he made were very good. He gave money to get better players. Yeah. Perfect. I'm much, I'm, I'm much, I'm as much a, a a fan of the trade deadline as anybody. But how can you form an attachment to the Mets right now? If you're a fan, you say, "Dude, I have no idea what what the fuck is going to happen in two right. two months." So Beatty, I don't know if he's going to be there. Uh, <laughs> Viendos, or uh, or even uh, I, I guess that they'll um, they'll keep that catcher uh, who I love uh, who I love a lot. E, e. Oh, Alvarez. Yeah, he seems to Youngster. be. Seems to be. A, yeah, he seems to be um, an anchor for for that team. Yeah. I, I know his teammates uh, love him very much. Yeah, no, and I I think um, some people complain about that. There's no no uh, ceiling as far as what teams can spend, but at the same time, you look at the Mets, Yankees, and what they're not doing with the resources. It just as a fan like me. I love it because <laughs> I'm not a fan of those teams, but even if, even as a neutral look, it makes, it makes you realize like it's, it's kind of cool that baseball's not just dominated by the big cities right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the California teams and New York teams, you got, you got a lot of good teams around the country for the last, uh, there's a lot more parity. I think that's what I'm basically getting at. And um, a lot of these teams that win have like, look at Tampa. Look at look at their payroll. Look at like Miami. They're right now they're right there in the playoffs. Yeah. They, they they don't even have a payroll <laughs> that matches some of the players the Yankees are paying for, like one player. I mean, and they're here they are. They're in contention and the Yankees are seven games out. I mean, the Mets, look, hey, the Mets are the Mets. I I, res, I respect the Yankees far more than I do the Mets as far as how the teams run. Because at least the at least the Yankees year to year are gonna be there. They're gonna be there. Not this year, but They, <laughs> I thought the Yankees were playing pretty well in the first half, considering who they didn't have. They were hanging. But now you look at I, I, last I looked, they were 28th in baseball and batting average. And you look at those players and you look at the box scores and you see those batting averages and you say to yourself, well, not, how, how can they possibly win with a team they're like this? They're old and slow and it's like, it's like one base at a time. Yeah. Giancarlo Stanton. I mean, oh. I mean, how can you pay that kind of salary? I mean, I, I, I'm not knocking on the guy. It, it's just they're always paid for what they did before. I wish there was this system, and I'm working on it with, with the um, with that with that fictional league on um, OTP, where I'd like to have that system where you're paid for what you produce. So it's the it's the homework or it's the duty of the team to have the money available if the team. I mean, if the if if the team is so good that everybody uh, like you uh, you mentioned war, if if you use war and war uh, each war is is a value of ten dollars, well at the end of the year you have to have the money to pay that that money because you produce that and you can save money too. 
if if the team was very bad, so I don't have to pay you. You know what I mean? But yeah, because, I the, 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 those young guys right now are not paid, and when they're getting paid, they they're getting paid for something they did in the in the past. Oh, well, the, there you how go. Does that make sense? It makes all the sense, and that's something I've like you. I have a big issue with. Like, I mean, look at Lindor on the yeah. Mets. Gets paid. Look at what he said. You can't hit two twenty five and get three hundred million dollar plus contract. Trey Turner's finally getting going, but he, he all these shortstops, Correa, all these guys who were fantastic for until they got paid. They paid uh, well Julio Rodriguez. Now he's one of the ones where they paid him, you know, after one like in the middle of his rookie season. So they're going to get the value from him in his early years with the big contract they gave him because he's young. He's twenty two, but these guys that they like to pay. 30s and on how often do they work even Pujols' contract with Anaheim didn't work that it was I mean he had a couple of nice decent beers but not what they thought they were getting but they should have known better and Acuna Riley Albies okay so well, that's they, the Braves for you that's yeah, that's yeah but they offered smart. them so the 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 um okay so the, the they spend less money in the long term but those guys are getting paid right now and they deserve every cent of that to be quite honest with you they're lo losing money too the the, the 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 players because i think they're maybe signing for too long uh, especially considering the, the talent level i mean acuna is losing so much money it's insane yeah but that's losing why that's why it'll be interesting to see when his contract's over. Yeah, <laughs> you're right about that. I mean, he's, he's still getting a nice, nice penny. But no, it'll be interesting to see Acuna as a great example when his contract does end with the Braves, wherever he ends up going, if he stays, I don't know. Will he then make money that he really probably shouldn't be getting for the second half of his career just to make up for what he didn't necessarily get with the Braves? Mm -hmm. I would hope the Braves, and I like Alex Anthopoulos, he's and I could see him being the kind of guy that potentially does something with Acuna in a few years to make the contract greater to keep him in his. Oh, he's in his prime now, and he's. It's scary to think Acuna's in his prime, but but there. He's twenty-five. No, he's younger than that. He's. Uh, let's see. Well, his brother. Acuna. His brother's, hmm? Acuna is is um uh, is younger than twenty-five. I think so because uh well the top of my head Julio Rodriguez is twenty-two. Boy, Cunha's age, I, I know he's he's 23, 24. Oh, I could be, I could be off. That's why it's funny. You just these these questions, sometimes you don't have to stat right in your mind. But, you're a Braves um, fan too. <laughs> I know it, I know it. But uh we'll look that one up. That's why <laughs> now, yeah, now sure. you're making me think I almost want to look it up right now. I, I wish I had uh, something to look it up. <laughs> but um <laughs> no, anyway, he uh yeah, it's okay. What, what were we saying though? Cunha, so Cunha. If, if in like three years, all right, let's just say he is 25. So then when he's 28, he gets paid uh, before his contract's up. And Anthopolis says, hey, I'll wind you for another five-year extension. And he ups that annual value. Then Acuna is going to make out fine because you're still going to get him in the years he should be in his prime. But it's when you see these guys at 32, 33, make, like the, Sh the Scherzer deal, right, for the Mets did not work out. And how old is he? You know, he's 38, 39. Verlander's 40. I mean, you're looking at why are you paying these guys, even though they're short contracts, why are you giving them 40 million a year? 30. I just well, what they did in the past. Yeah. And and the Scherzer has and and obviously Verlander, even though he had a Cy Young last year, but remember he missed all of previous season. And Scherzer's been in, you know, he, he hasn't been healthy every year for the last few years. He's had his stints on the IL. So you gotta know what you're paying for. But I I think a lot of it is especially someone like especially someone like Cohen it's like they look at it and say I'm gonna look good for bring I'm trying to win now they're gonna respect me for bringing Verlander and Scherzer especially after I shipped the ground <laughs> we didn't want the ground we got rid of him. we didn't resign. so it's like I, I think it's he's looking at it as fans are gonna respect me for bringing Verlander in to take over for the ground except when it's not working out this year and they're both suddenly on contending teams out in the West. And he paid to get them out of town. He paid yeah. to get them out of town. Think about yeah. that. Yeah. And I think it's interesting how I like that move, though, where he got Acuna from Texas, the brother, the younger yeah. brother. And statistically, he looks like he's going to be a good player. And uh, that might work out long term. But my gosh, like you said, the money that they – because he's they still have to pay out a lot of that contract, too. It's not like Texas is eating all of it. So – 
I don't know. I guess when you have unlimited funds like that, you can you can do whatever. But you, man, you if you're the Mets, you better. I tell you what, if they aren't good for another two or three years, I don't know how you're right. How are fans even going to stay on board with that? You go and be a Yankees fan. Oh, wait, no, you can't. I <laughs> hey, Justin, that was a lot of fun, man. That's great. Did, did you like it? This. What's that? Did you like it? Come on. Oh, absolutely. This is, this is, uh, we got to do this again. Absolutely. Sure. Man. Yeah, uh, but I, uh, if the 11 people that, would, uh, that are watching this want to know where they can find your writing, so you do a recap of each game or pretty much each game every day, where can they go? Well, this will be the Substack, so baseballfanperspective.substack.com. Um, yeah, check it out. And uh, <laughs> I appreciate the interview. I really do. This was uh, great just talking baseball with another fan. I think that's, that was what's fun about this. So doing that. thanks, Dave. I appreciate it.